Hi, I'm going to make a movie about uh, putting solar panels on a Sunseeker 2300 Class C motorhome. I'll make it as short as I can and no shorter. I put two 100 watt panels and two 50 watt panels. I had the 50s so I decided just to incorporate them in the installation. Uh, one thing I would say is I don't like this little L or Z bracket. Uh, I wish I had used maybe two of them. One, uh, you know, make a higher lift and then have a screw attachment in the middle because it's very hard to get to the attachment underneath. I had to buy a ratcheting box end 8 millimeter wrench to make it happen. Um, I used adhesive uh, 3M whatever that tape is that uh, under the mounts and then I decided I was just not sure about that so I put a screw through each one and then had to decor over everything. Um, I bought them thinking I was going to parallel all four sets of cables into one by a four-in-one connector which I bought or four-in-one connectors and then I found out you can't really do that because um, if you parallel more than two panels um, and one of them shorts the current from the other remaining panels will cause the shorted panel to catch fire or possibly the wiring so they have to be fused so I had to buy a six by six junction box at the local home center store and the cover and I'll post a photo of the insides of this but basically uh, all four pairs of wires run into it there are junction blocks that I put inside of it and then fuses and then two wires come out they run into the fridge um, vent and then down to the fridge compartment and into the RV One factor to think about when you're um, locating your panels is you want to be at least as far from an object as the object is tall. Uh, that'll give you a 45 degree angle of sun that's still going to hit the panel. If you get any coverage on the panel, even this much, it can kill the output of the whole panel. And that would be a shadow doing that. So I found out where those things peaked. I uh, stayed away from the air conditioners, it turned out. If you have an antenna like this that goes up in the air three feet or so, and then can swing around in a big arc, just the fin from the one end of the antenna can cast a shadow. So you'd have to say up front, you'd have to be very aware of all the places that that shadow could cover at a 45 degree angle. Um, but anyway, that's a, my basic design principle. P different people have different ideas. The farther away you get from an object, the less likely you are to have shade. If you were to put it, you know, put this panel right up close to that vent, um, there would be times when it would be shaded and would be worthless. So, you know, you just have to see where you can fit them. One tip I will add is that other people have used these gray boxes for the same purpose and the lids fell apart from the sun. So I put, uh, I happen to have a roll of real good aluminum foil tape and I put that on there and it's held up great. You can also buy now, you know, Krylon and Rust-Oleum plastic paint, spray paint, and you could just paint this whole thing. That would protect it from the sun also. It's going to be a little hard to see because black on black, but I've got two wires coming down. I believe they're 8 or 10 gauge um, coming down. They're, I've attached them up against the wall in there, which you can't see. I use what's called a cable tie mount adhesive with a screw and then cable ties. Tied it off here, tied it off here, and then there were there was already a hole going through down actually to the under the kitchen area because of the copper line so I had to dig out some of the sealant there and then route them into there to go under the kitchen cabinetry 
and then I foamed it back up. Bear with me as we continue here. Now we're looking under the kitchen cabinet, under the oven, and the furnace is way back in the corner back there. You can see the two ducts coming out of it, and then you might be able to see the copper piping back there. Uh, where the copper piping comes down from the ceiling, or the top of this picture, is where the uh, solar lines came through. Then we ran it under the, under the kitchen cabinet, so under the oven, and then under the sink, and into here. The solar cables come up in the back corner, and they come to the controller, which is over here. I have it out right now, uh, just so I could access something here. Uh, there was already a switch down here, uh, the on-off switch for connecting the converter and the coach to the batteries. I moved the converter, I bought a new one, Progressive Dynamics, and I put it in here so it could be very close to the batteries. I insulated the ducts. It doesn't really get warm in here. It didn't really get that warm in here anyway with, without insulating the ducts. I did a temperature reading in here when the heat was on, the furnace was running, and it, it didn't heat up like I thought it would, but I insulated the ducts. Um, so now there are converter cables running to the switch. There's an inverter back over this way. You may have seen in, uh, when I was looking under the, the shot under the oven. Um, I used these switches as recommended by Handy Bob Solar Blog. And the neutrals tie together, I'll show you back there at a post, an isolation terminal that I bought. Here's the controller, a 30 amp Renogy Adventurer controller. It has a voltage sensing line which runs to the batteries and it has a temperature sensing line which runs to the battery area, battery box. So it will adjust the rate of the charging voltage according to both battery voltage, true battery voltage, irregardless of losses that are uh, between this and the battery, and also according to battery temperature, which can make a big difference. There are also charging profiles. There are three charging profiles in here, one for uh, gel batteries, one for sealed, which I assume is AGM, and one for regular flooded batteries. In here, this was invaluable to build the ship in the bottle to take the vent out and push that vent back out of the way. Up here you can see, maybe you can see, there's the isolation post I bought, a terminal, and I connected the grounds to it, and there's a two gauge ground, black ground wire running down to the frame grounding terminal that the system used anyway. Then there's the two gauge uh, battery terminal running down to the batteries. I put my little charge wizard up here on the wall with a Velcro and the uh, vent that was here, it's just one of those typical swivel vents. You pry off the slotted cover with a putty knife from in, you know, you just go in behind it and pop it off. And then there's these four screws that hold the flange. You pull the flange out and the uh, duct is connected to that. You can disconnect it and then push the duct back in out of your way so you can work. I had to dig out foam that was in here and run some extra wires through, of course, and uh, then foamed it back up. That's for mouse proofing and uh, seal, you know, insulation. The battery box, if we can show it here, on this is right, right there, right under that step, and everything runs from this point here down underneath and into holes that are underneath the step, that open air holes that go into the battery box, and that is a good enough way, I think, to build a ship in a bottle, get a solar system, a solar panel system hooked up to um, this Sunseeker Class C. I thought I might touch briefly on how I cut the hole for people who are concerned about that and uh, how I mounted this. Um, I, there's very little wiggle room as far as the size of this flange versus the size of the cutout. So it had to be precise. I used a right angle, uh, a square 
I'm not a carpenter, I can't think what you call those things, but just a carpenter's square thing. And I measured precisely what I needed and I laid it out with pencil. I drilled about a 3 16 or quarter inch hole in each corner. And then I just used a utility knife and I went very slow. You know, should get a very sharp blade, brand new blade, and just go very slow. And just take your time. It doesn't take much. This stuff's only about an eighth of an inch thick. It's not much more than cutting cardboard, really. I cut it so that the existing framing member right here was just beyond the cut. And um, that way the screws would be going into some wood instead of just into this, this flimsy stuff. And so I glued, just use regular wood glue or Elmer's glue, and I glued a piece of wood here to do the same thing. And then later I realized it'd be a good place to mount my, my uh, switches. So now, you know, when this goes in here, the screws go into, into wood and the switches are conveniently located. Well, <laughs> again, it's the ship in the bottle thing. They're not that convenient, but I'll switch gears here and talk about that. Okay, a good question to ask would be, how do I intend to get to those switches? Um, the drawer stops only, I mean, almost flush the back end of the drawer when you pull it out, and you've just got a small gap to get in there. One way is you can um, flip the drawer. I don't know if they're on here or not. I won't bother showing you that, but there are little black plastic uh, levers, one on each side, and one goes up and the other one goes down and you can loosen the drawer so you could pull the drawer out. You wouldn't have to take it all the way off. It'll just slide farther out on the on the track and then it would be out far enough you could stick your hand and that's one way. You know, it's a ship in a bottle. I keep saying that and it's true. So, you know, there, it's a compromise you have to make. If you're going to put those switches on the outside over here, you're going to have a mess, at least by my way of thinking. There's the panel snugged up tight. You'd have switches and wires and everything and I just didn't feel like doing that. I don't have to access them that often, so 